Every day, millions of signals are being sent back and forth across the internet, and each signal is a conversation, a start of a talking point for someone. It's called the post-truth era that we live within. It's a term that's used to describe an era of the 21st century where fact is less relevant than beliefs and personal opinions, where emotional appeals are used to sway public audience, and where each person is a publisher and a reader at the same time. Now, this is really exciting, right? It creates free space and all of those, all of those things as well. But what it also does is create strong beliefs that reside in echo chambers in the absence of systematic metrics for what is quality information. And that's what I'm here to talk to you about. You all know Harari, or some, or an author you might have all read at some point, famously said that censorship no longer works by hiding information from you. Censorship now works by flooding you with, with irrelevant information. So much so of cat videos, of uh, auntie memes, so much so that you can't focus on anything anymore. Now, what does this do to us and our psychology as society? Think about it. When you hear or encounter any new information from a stranger on, on the road, you don't believe everything you hear, right? There is some cognitive process that your brain undergoes that checks what you're being, what you're being told or what you're absorbing and where these people are coming from. Now, why don't we apply the same cognitive principles to our online lives? Or oh, Chirag, it's an obvious answer. Not everyone has the time to sit and process and critically question all the information that we get online. I agree. Dumb question, maybe. But we don't stop there, and we can't. This is why we can't stop there. Because our society is, is, is premised and, and based upon a few belief systems, right? What are our belief systems based upon? The things that we can all agree upon. And how do we agree upon things? Based on the information that we are fed. So at some level, the societies that we create, our moral norms, our social norms, and the, and the rules that we all live within, all come down to the basic forms of information that we access and agree upon. As inhabitants and future decision makers of online spaces, each one of us has a responsibility to create a more free, healthy, and, and quality information online space. A space where people of all walks of life can make sense of the clutter that exists in the world around them, and be able to navigate the online world free from malign. So here's the big question. Can we apply, or why don't we apply, the same concepts of critical questioning that we have in our offline worlds to our online worlds? I'm here to tell you how tech can really help us go ahead. The first, most primal question, what is being said? What is the story here? The second, who is talking about it? In the sense of where is the story coming from? How, did, how does the person who's telling me know about it? And where could this conversation go? The third, and this is something that we, we, we accumulate and aggregate, is how accurate is this information I'm getting? And finally, what's, what's important to us is how powerful or important is this story that I'm hearing? Now, when we put these four questions, these simple, basic, primal questions that our brain processes with any new information together, and apply it to a technological paradigm or digital spaces, we can actually create much freer spaces proactively. What does this look like? Let's get into it. The first, what is being said? There's a process called natural language processing, right? It's an artificial intelligence tool that allows computers to actually understand voice and text just as you and I would understand it. And this is trained over years and years of data and, and large volumes of data. But the large point is that when any news or piece of information is, is moving online, it moves through a trajectory. And the most important part is to be able to catch the information or story early on. Just like the classroom monitor example, you would have technology operating in a space before these conversations go online. Now, in this green area, remember, our conversation or this story is yet to go viral. Now, what is being said is important to understand. And here, for example, I'm going to take something that we picked up early in March 2020, right? Um, this was at the peak of lockdown in India, about five days after um, the COVID lockdowns were, were imposed. And we picked up murmurs about these few keywords being talked about. China, coronavirus, bio-warfare, animal market. These were conversations or keywords that have been talked about across the internet in small pockets, uh, in small pockets of conversation. Now, that's not good enough, right? Just because you know these four words, it could be China, coronavirus, bio-warfare, 
or it could be China, coronavirus, bio-warfare. You realize what's different about it? Not only do I know what's being said, but I need to know the tone of what's being said. I need to know what, is, what sentiments or emotions are associated with it. So you hear a story, but you also know how people are talking about this story. Which is to say, here we see that people are mostly angry or concerned about the conversation to do with China and the coronavirus. Now that we have this information, we can move on to the next bit, right? We can ask or take the help of technology to understand who are the people talking about this. Now it's important because if the same piece of information was told to you by a teacher, by a parent, by a friend, by a stranger, our brain processes and associates with it differently, who the people talking about a said conversation are. In the, and remember, this is still us operating in the green zone before a conversation has gone viral, right? We see that um, the conversation about China, coronavirus, bio-warfare has largely been picked up by a few retail investors who seem to be worried about their stocks in Chinese companies. Uh, they seem to have been picked up by politicians who are aggravated and angry about uh, the geopolitical implications of this. And they're also picked up by journalists who believe that this is an important public story to carry. Now, why is this important to know? It's important to know because at this stage, we know who is talking about it and what tendency it might have to go viral or mainstream. And this is really important because we can also identify allied interests that this conversation might affect. So for example, retail investors, journalists, and politicians would definitely affect how voters think, how news readers interact with China, for example, and how investors um, look at the markets or global markets it's itself. Now what's really cool with this is that we can also identify how fake or honest or true this um, conversation is with the use of technology. There's no way for us to actually discern or identify where one of our friends or classmates have received a certain piece of information dating back. But technology allows us to do that. We can trace back to the origin of these conversations. We can trace back to the tra trajectory and how we've got into where we are today. And in this example, what we find, if you look at the red dots on the top, in the cluster on top, it actually shows us that it was actually largely originated by bots. The red dots that you see are bot users on the internet. And these, are, the, these can be detected because bots exhibit a very typical sort of online behavior that cannot be replicated by human beings. Think about it. It's an automated na nature of clicking, sharing, posting. And it, it, it's viral and, and aggravated to some extent. We can also predict how viral or how fast this conversation is moving. The next question that I want to ask, how accurate is this information? Right? Now, using network analysis, we've, we've understood so far how this conversation has reached where it, where it is, who the people talking about it are, and what exactly the sentiments associated with this conversation are. Now we want to know how accurate is it. We use some basic, simple questions or thought processes, things that we have personally applied in our time at the Bastion as, as, as editors, and we've applied those to what news and information we consume and access online. Here's the originating news story of the conversation that I've been showing you, right? It's a story published by Lokmat. It's a Marathi and Hindi uh, news daily that publishes shocking details exposed by China's military intelligence officer. Five days after lockdown, um, frazzled you know, citizens, a frazzled government, lots of conversations going about. Imagine how important this conversation is to catch out before it spreads to the mainstream. And that's exactly what technology can help us do. The minute information like this comes across us um, on our news feeds, the human brain is not wired to be able to process and critically question it in that moment. The human brain is processed to react to this information immediately. What technology can, can help us is be able to discern fact from, from, from fake, um, to discern more truth. Now, this is not to say that there's an absolute truth and false, but to say that there are degrees of truth or accuracy that we can all strive for. So we can check for language and style, domain and reputation, factual progression, tone and objectivity, things that typically bots and trolls are, are, are pretty bad at. And we can check this out pretty early on. Imagine being able to use this to actually call out misinformation or fake news that's shared on your WhatsApp groups, many of which you might have woken up to this morning, literally. And if we can create a, a, a basket for it, we can come up with a score rating to un understand how accurate this piece of information is. At this point, we know what the conversation is, we know how it's gotten here, and we know the story or how accurate the story is. Um, and it's not too encouraging right now, right? Now is the important point. What do we do with this information? 
What you see here is the ability to predict the tendency that a new a piece of information can sway uh, online, online readers and general markets. Now, you might say that these conversations exist only online, but we all know that that isn't true. What exists online does replicate and transform in many ways to affect our offline lives. In this way, there are many possible effects that this can have, right? If you look at just the retail investor aspect of things, we can predict how powerful or what kind of impact this fake narrative can have on Chinese companies in India, for example. You can also predict how many new customers of these companies might be affected, what, what is the total share of voice on the internet that this conversation is likely to uh, take up, um, what, to, what profile categories are most likely to be swayed by. And you can also map this on the plethora of actors that might be affected by this. Your government, your think tanks, the policy people that decide um, the next laws or the next ways in which to design a lockdown, for example. The potential power of this story is important for us to understand simply because it allows us to know whether or not to act, whether or not to intervene, and how to go about acting in it. Now, put together, all of this will give us enough information as a classroom monitor to go and tell a concerned authority, a brand, an online entity, that this is being said about you in this tone, and it could affect you and come back to harm you in so many ways. The end goal, keeping in mind, is that the user or online readers should have more accurate, more reliable online information. And why is all of this important, right? You might say, okay, Chirag, you're telling us all of this, but I'm just an online consumer, and I'm not gonna get affected by misinformation or maligned intent. Well, what if I told you that each one of us and the truths and realities that we have about the world we live in are formed by what information we access, right? If debate and free speech is the bedrock of democracy, then the fundamental unit of that debate and free speech comes down to the information that we are privy to. The sanity, cleanliness, and quality of that information is important for each one of us, especially so as we're the next generation of online digital users. Users, decision makers, whoever you might be online, what information we can access decides what collective movements we can get behind together. The, solving the world's largest problems, right, climate change, poverty, the coronavirus. It needs us all to identify individually, but come together collectively. And I don't, mind, I don't mean identify individually in some meta out there term. I mean identify individually in terms of the information that's right under our nose. It means understanding that not all information that we come across on social media is with the intent to inform and improve our awareness or knowledge of things. It comes with the awareness, or it starts with the awareness that the force, frequency, and scope of social media allows us to be manipulated in ways that our brain cannot even process. And that's okay, because we still have technology to help us alleviate some of this. In fact, I think, we, I think the argument should be that we should use technology to alleviate some of these problems, because technology created these problems in the first place, right? Failing to do so inherently makes these spaces unfree. It makes some voices louder than others, and while the whole premise of anybody can post is true, some voices are louder because of the way in which they say certain things and the things that they talk about. For example, angry, controversial, inflammatory content is more likely to spread across social media than genuine resistance, um, feel-good movements, anything of that sort. What it allows for is also for us to be able to pick up honest, um, accurate information and movements from spaces that we would, uh, wouldn't otherwise see. How, much, how many of us actually see movements from tier two or tier three cities in India? That is the largest population of internet users or, or active tweeters, but we all see a certain language of online um, conversation, right? The things that we see that are trending are privy more to us than what is honestly a reflection of the world around us. We should, and I can see that we have content creators who are like, that is not ideal for us. But um, what, I, what I do believe is that we can start pushing for each stakeholder and aspect on social media to harbor and create a safer space on the internet. Now, this involves policymakers, your government stakeholders, private entities, and each, each and every user. And technology, and asking smart questions with technology can help us do so. Now, the status quo is that we react to online information, right? Once something goes viral, 
then we can come out and put our PR policies, public statements, government memoranda. But that's not good enough. Once something goes viral, it's already a part of the public conscience. And in some ways, damage control isn't good enough. We need to be proactive about the ways that we tackle misinformation and, and ill intent on the internet. And I think technology can, can play a big role in doing so. When you think about it, we're all taught, right, as kids to follow certain life virtues. Be kind, uh, maintain discipline, work hard, be aspirational. It's time we added the pursuit towards good quality information to that list of, of good values. There's no lack of intent in this, in this room itself. That's why we're all in school, right? Towards the pursuit of better information. And it's time that we started acting upon that. And I hope that I've made some change towards that. Thank you guys, you've been a great audience.